investments and opportunities for the future. So is that the best move at this point for Europe and the United States? Well, joining me now for more, Bloomberg's Alex Steele. Alex, so you heard what sec former Secretary of the Treasury said. Do you find that people are really doing, I mean, I know they've been selling some of their U.S. bond holdings, but is there really a big move into risky assets, even though we got the surge today in stocks? It's a great question. Uh, longer term, we'll see Alec Young of uh, S&P Capital IQ said that we've seen these hope spring internal risk rallies before and that there actually has to be some follow through or follow up for them to eventually wind up panning out. And as to why we rallied today, there seemed to have been a plethora of options when I was talking to traders. And uh, one of the prevailing ones was just, quite frankly, an oversold bounce from Friday. That's very different than a real move into risk assets that actually has commitment. And that's just more, look how down we were on Friday. It took two days to digest it, and now we're finally up. Because not that much has changed. We haven't gotten any major earnings announcements. Right. There haven't been any major takeover announcements. And there's not been really any change in terms of what's going on in Europe. Sure. And the one person, of course, who's going to disagree with me would be a Michael Guyot of uh, Pension Partners, I've been talking to him all day about the rally and what that means. And he says that the markets are actually going higher because there is no need for stimulus. He was looking at those really positive earnings from Hovnani and after eight consecutive misses, finally reports a win of two cents a share. The expectation was a loss of 32 cents a share. He's saying, look, if that means the housing market's better, that's its own form of stimulus. Housing market better. We got the beige book that tracks the 12 Federal Reserve districts today. They talked about the housing market at least stabilizing they also said factory output in the United States that is bolstering the economy. Yeah, and look at what happened to gold. I mean, in, in looking at what the result of the beige book, it seemed like gold had the clearest reaction to it. It sold off immediately, and then it was down, I mean, it was up about three or four bucks in the day. I mean, look at that. Right as the beige book came out, boom, gold hit the floor. And I was talking to one trader that said that if Ben Bernanke testifies tomorrow and says nothing or maintains the status quo or says something more hawkish like we heard maybe in the beige book, then gold would definitely sell off even more. I spoke to him again today and he said, look out below. That seemed to paint the clearer story today. Look out below for gold. Yes. Indeed. All right, just stay with us because I want to bring in Michael Purvis. He is the chief global strategist at Wheaton and Company, and he's not a bull. He's not a bear. He's a wolf, and we're going to find out why. Michael, always a pleasure to have you with us. Before we find out how you are a wolf, I want to understand this anomaly. Why would stocks go up if investors think the economy in the United States and around the world is weak and therefore they got to look to central bankers for either more liquidity or even lower interest rates to try to, try to spur economic activity. This is like a nominal increase in prices, right? I, exactly. I would agree with what Alex just referenced about this sort of relief balance and these oversold conditions. That's how I looked at that. I think the only fundamental news, uh, which is not really news, but it's sort of a reinforcement of a broader theme, which I think is very important to the markets, is this concept that the, the, the central banks, whether it's here in the United States or in Europe, are really there as tail risk managers. And you see that as things get ugly, they kind of step in, make some uh, motions in that direction. Sort of essentially, you know, we talked about the Bernanke put, well, there's an ECB put arguably as well. And maybe those puts are acting more and more in concert, you know, as we muddle through this giant deleveraging we're seeing in developed markets. So I think it's, I agree, I think it's a, it's a relief balance, and I think the broader risk is to the downside uh, going into this, uh, you know, third summer of, you know, Eurozone volatility. And is that to the downside because the economic data is going to continue to get bad, or is that to the downside because central banks won't step in and provide stimulus? And then what did you make of gold as a predictor of that? Right. Well, I, I would disassociate gold from that, uh, and I'll get to that in a second. But I think near term, I think the risk, you know, corporate earnings, Havnani and all that kind of stuff, we've seen strong corporate earnings, you know, emerge out of the 2008 Lehman Brothers crisis. They've been, you know, the, these corporations have been unsung heroes. The housing issues are deep structural issues. There's more, year, several years of resolution to come there. So we may be at a bottom on Case Shiller, but I don't know whether we're bouncing off the bottom right there. But we, what we do know is, is that we have a lot of exports, of, you know, the export recovery is a big part of the United States story. And in the face of a stronger dollar and a weaker Europe and a weaker China and a weaker Brazil and a weaker India, that, that's going to take some wind out of the sails there. You mean you don't undo 25 years of profligacy in just four years of exactly. austerity? <laughs> this is going to continue for a while, you believe? Right, exactly. No, I, I, I think so. I think, you know, like these, you know, uh, Rogoff has point, painted this picture very clearly that, you know, these, you know, real estate and credit collapses are, you know, at least five years of resolution. And we have this in the United States coupled with a credit issue in Europe. 
that it will be deep and structural. And unfortunately, in Europe, they don't have the political federation and union to really deal with these things in the way you know we, we would like to see them. Now, last time you were on the show, uh, you liked gold stocks and regional banks. You just made a pretty compelling case for why the next leg is to the downside. Do you still like those two sectors? Well, I, you know, gold I disassociate from 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 regular equity, gold mining from equities because I look at them as really gold derivatives, uh, and I think they're very, you know, value price derivatives right now. What um, does that mean? Buy them or sell them? I, I think you buy them. I think you know. Already after this up move. Oh, with, without question. I would disagree with your, uh, your your colleague you were talking to earlier, who was uh, short on gold. Go gold has been going through a, a uh, you know, it's a very technical trade. It's been going through a strong, uh, a very complicated resolution from the peaks it reached last August. But remember, gold, uh, like these housing issues, are very long term. The gold, the gold bull story is about currency diversification that takes place over years and years and years. And at the end of the day, any action that we see out of Europe will ultimately be gold new supportive. Um, any, uh, the, what's happening with the Fed here is gold new supportive. So I continue to be a structural bull on gold. Having said that, trading gold around in the near term, you know, is tricky when you're getting through these resolution, these technical violations of the 200-day moving average we saw in December. Why are you a wolf, and what's a wolf when it comes to the world of investing? It, it's very interesting. I think the, the wolf market is that we're not in a regular bull market, nor are we in a bear market. We're in this sort of range-bound, volatile, um, uh, and very technically defined market. And so, you know, when I look at the market, I try to figure out where the floor in the market is and where's the ceiling in the market, and what's particularly interesting in these days is how do you get there uh, back and forth between those floors and ceilings. Um, you know, the, the average VIX over the last couple of years is twice what it was during 2004, 2005, which were the recovery years after the recovery of 2003 or 2009. And uh, yet the equity returns were the same. So we're, 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 we're sort of grinding through this mess, but with a much more volatile condition. I think that's going to stay on, and I think it's very important. As you looked at last year, we had this huge volatility, the VIX above th uh, 30 for 38% of the trading days. When you went into August, you had this big volatility spike, and the market stayed very choppy for four months, right? But did you, did the, ultimately the market just grew, went sideways. And what happens is, is that people have to become associated with higher volatility. It doesn't mean the markets break into you know, record floors. It means that they're just volatile. But isn't that going to keep a lot of money on the sidelines so scared of the volatility to prevent some kind of un affirmative un direction? Un unfortunately, another? that's one of the uh, byproducts of this uh, higher volatility, and that's going to continue until investors just sort of start stomaching these higher volatility levels. And I think that's probably going to happen. Um, uh, over time. I want to thank you very much. Michael Purvis joining us, Chief Market Strategist, Wheaton & Company. Thanks for spending time with us as always. And our thanks to Alex Steele. We'll see you on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Thank you.